Thank you. <clears throat> it's a great conference. Congratulations to the organizers, and uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, so this talk is about now casting. And let me see. So what is now casting? We have already heard about that. So it's a contraction, a strange contraction of two terms, now and forecasting. And this concept has uh, been used in, for a long time in meteorology. Actually, meteorology since 86, I think is the first time I've heard about this term. And it refers to the forecasting, the weather, up to 6, 12 hours. It's a very, very short-term forecast. However, in economics, this uh, concept of now casting has been introduced only recently. And, uh, and actually, this is uh, strange because, you know, forecasting in economics is uh, much more difficult than forecasting weather. You know, you can look out to your window and see whether it's rainy or it's sunny. In economics, instead, <laughs> we have to wait a long time to see what is the situation. more difficult, you have a longer delay. We have to wait until mid of August in order to have an estimate of where we are now. In Brazil, we still don't have the estimate for the first quarter. So we have to wait, I think, until the end of the month in order to know where we were last quarter. So this led, to, led me to define our casting as the forecasting of the near future, let's say next quarter, the present, this quarter, and even the recent past, last quarter for the case of, uh, of Brazil. So this presentation is going to be about, uh, uh, is based on uh, a And uh, this is typically done using formal economic modeling on the relationship between key macroeconomic variables. Think, for example, of uh, the traditional, let's say, a, a small scale macro model. You have consumption, investment, GDP, hours, everything typically measured quarterly. And typically the forecast is for next quarter or a few quarters ahead. And these forecasts are done using formal modeling, like uh, vector autoregressions, like factor models, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. So here, really, the econometric techniques are used at their best. However, when you move to shorter term forecasting, what you tend to see is that these, uh, these forecasts are typically based on simplified heuristic scrutiny of uh, of many variables, so a var variety of conjunctural indicators. And typically, these are indicators that uh, you know, the typical macroeconomists don't look at. For example, survey data, or weekly claims, or you know, all this uh, consumer confidence. So these are all uh, indicators that we typically, as macroeconomists, don't consider. And the way they are used are also don't exploit the kind of uh, uh, models, state-of-the-art uh, modeling techniques that are typically used for longer-term forecast. And another feature when you look at forecasting is that, uh, you know, the forecasts are typically updated infrequently. 
So, for example, uh, I think the most frequent forecasts are done at uh, central banks. Typically, forecasts are done every quarter. At the, in the United States, every time there is uh, a round of the FOMC meetings. In Europe, it is done every quarter as well. Other institutions, for example, the OECD, the IMF, they produce the forecast only twice a year, so semi-annual frequency. And uh, so this, uh, during this talk, what I'm going to discuss are the following questions that raise when you start thinking more deeply about the problem of now casting. And so the first question is, obviously, how important is now casting? relative to longer horizon forecast. So I remember one of the first comments when I was presenting the first result about now casting in central banks was like, you know, but in central bank we care about the longer horizon, like one year and a half, who cares about now? So we are gonna address this question. The second one is, uh, how, in, let's suppose it's important, okay? And then can we predict it? Okay, so can we make a, a now cast that is based on formal modeling without informal judgment? And finally, another, the last question is how relevant is this conjunctural information? This data about like surveys and consumer confidence and so on. And related to this is how often should we update our forecast? So does it make sense to wait every quarter or to do it only twice a year or there is uh, some value added in updating it every day or every time new data arrive? Uh, so first question, how important is now casting relative to longer horizon forecast? So this is uh, a table where I compare forecasts produced by judgment. This, uh, this is GB. The first line refers to the Green Book, is the forecast prepared for the FOMC meeting by the Fed staff. And the other line refers to the survey of professional forecast. You know, Philadelphia Fed every quarter does a survey asking professional forecasters what they think about uh, different variables in the future. And, uh, and then you can average that. That's a consensus. And here I report a way of evaluating this forecast is uh, mean square forecast error relative to a naive model. So mean square forecast error is really the, the outer minus what was predicted, you square and then average. And you compare this measure with the measure that uh, you know, a simple model would have made. This is uh, a model, a forecast that my grandmother would have made. Like it's a constant growth. So in the case of the United States, constant growth is, you know, GDP growth is 2% every quarter. Okay. And number larger than one mean that, you know, the Fed staff is worse than my grandmother in forecasting. Number smaller than one means that uh, they are better. And here you can see that only at zero you have a number that is smaller than one. So I hope that... Uh, this convinces you that the presence is the only horizon of predictability. There is unpredictability beyond current quarter. And uh, this implies that our macroeconomic projections are strongly, they strongly rely on the accuracy of our starting conditions. So these results don't mean that you know, projections are useless. They are used they are useful in order to organize, to understand the relation between macro variables. However, this result tells you that the accuracy will depend strongly on doing a very good job in the present. And actually, in that case, you could do it using judgment. So the next, quest, next question is, uh, how can we do predict the present? Can, are, can we make predictions that are comparable to, with the one made by you know, this, the Fed stuff, there are many people doing this. They discuss, they construct their forecasts using judgment. These are, a lot of this is done by sectoral experts. And the same for the survey of professional forecasts. There are many forecasters, each of them has their judgment, you average them and so on. So the question is, can we replicate this with uh, a machine? 
can we replicate this expert judgment with the machine? Actually, this is a, it was, so this is a, uh, a book about Manibal. So it's about replacing expert judgment in the hiring in the, uh, of a baseball team, replacing it with an algorithm. And uh, okay, so this, uh, this is a picture that is, uh, they made a movie out of it. And this is a picture with the sectoral experts, okay? And this is uh, the computer algorithm. This is a nerdy computer guy that is trying to program an algorithm in order to replace this expert. So I'm gonna play the role of uh, the nerdy. <laughs> and okay, so just uh, to anticipate uh, some of the results. So this is uh, now casting 10 years of experience. So here, the, the red area here is the outer GDP growth in the United States. And the green balls here are forecasts produced by expert judgment. In this case, it's survey of professional forecast, very correlated with the green book, the Fed staff forecast. You know, they did uh, quite uh, a good job. Okay, in, uh, during the expansion, they were pretty good. You know, after a while, they realized there was a recession. They got it well. Also, during the recovery, they were doing pretty well. Now, why you want to replace these guys with the computer, with the computer algorithm? So there are different reasons. The first one, as I told you, you know, you have to wait a quarter every time in order to understand what's going on while there is a lot of data out there. And another reason is that, you know, these, uh, these forecasts can be good, can be accurate, but there is, uh, there is uh, some, uh, some element that can induce some distortions. Uh, distortion can come from strategic interaction between forecasters. You know, you don't want to be different from the others, so that you have herding behavior. Another reason is uh, mood. So forecasters, so you know, Human judgment can be great, but you know, we are affected by mood, okay? And mood can be dangerous. So I think this is a good example of how mood can distort the forecast. We are, we are in uh, 2001. There was a recession that was dated by the MBR committee starting at the beginning of the year. And, uh, and then the, uh, the, the trough of the recession was dated to be the third quarter. You know, these guys, the forecasters, didn't get it, okay? You see these three balls here, they were predicting positive growth. And then, just when the recession ended, they started forecasting a recession. This was the effect of 9-11, okay? Now, the computer machine, what we'll do is, is this job here. So, it's a machine that will uh, compute this forecast continuously, okay? And this is the result. This is uh, putting this machine in real time. And actually what you see here is that uh, it's a sort of joining these dots. So, and it's very much in line with judgment. So it means that, you know, you can make a forecast that is as accurate, but it turns out also to be very correlated with judgment. So you are able to replicate with the machine what this judgmental forecast were doing. Most importantly, since it's a machine, you can run it every minute, okay? And uh, this means that you don't have to wait, you know, every quarter, you know, because why the forecasts are updated infrequently? Because these people have to meet, they have to discuss, and so on. With the machine, instead, you can join these dots. And so, this is, so I think uh, this, the, uh, this graph here, I hope it convinces you that uh, what I'm gonna show you will work. Uh, okay, so how to, how to construct this, this, uh, uh, this computer algorithm? So the way is, uh, we did it is to l learn from markets. And actually, if you go on, uh, uh, so market, what did the market do? They obsessively monitor macroeconomic data releases. You know, if you go on a trading floor, there are these guys with a lot of screens in front of them. And one of these screens they have is a Bloomberg screen where there are all the single data releases that are gonna appear during the day. They have exact hours. And uh, 
so they obsessively do this. And uh, what happens is that, you know, the information about the economy is conveyed by official uh, releases. And the market participants form expectations about these uh, reports. And, uh, and when realizations are different from this, they do you have a news? And typically markets, if you have a news that is sizable, market uh, react to this. Stock prices go up or down, and uh, interest rates and so on. So this is uh, uh, a screen that uh, is not exactly, uh, this I downloaded from the web. It's from uh, uh, Bloomberg.com. It's a calendar of data releases next week. You know, you have important releases, you're gonna have the industrial production release, then look, people look at inventories. You know, there are a lot of, uh, there is a Bloomberg Comfort Index, uh, then the leading indicator we have been hearing today, and so on. Uh, and uh, so here is an example of a release that, uh, uh, of last week. Actually, it's considered one of the most important data releases in the United States, is the employment report. And uh, so the consensus is the forecast made by this forecaster. People were forecasting uh, 150,000 more jobs, job creation, 150 uh, new jobs created. And the range was between 100 and 200, and the actual was 165. So there was a positive news that was commented on the media. And so this was the April, April job report. It was good news for the stocks. Bonds uh, prices went down. And uh, so this is uh, a plot of this, uh, this uh, data about the non-farm payrolls. And this uh, yellow line here are the forecasts that were made by the markets. The difference between the two are news to which the uh, market reacts. So here are... Uh, a few quotes from the newspapers, you know, every time. Like, they also, uh, for example, there were a weak job report in, uh, in, uh, in August. It was released in September, 7th of September. This was a comment about the fact that this might induce the Fed to do a new stimulus, secure, and indeed, they did uh, quantitative EC3. So this, uh, this kind of uh, high frequency data are also important for the implementation of monetary policy. Uh, okay, so we are gonna mimic exactly what the markets do. And uh, how to do this? Very simply, we will just uh, go take out of the shelf uh, state of the art macroeconomic models, reduced form macro models, and uh, so we will construct a joint model for all the data that are released throughout, uh, uh, continuously released. And we'll, we'll update this model in real time accordingly to the real time data flow. And uh, so this is gonna be model-based forecast, so free of judgment, mood heating, as I said before. Uh, herding, sorry. And, uh, and interestingly, what we are gonna do as a byproduct, we are gonna translate the news on the markets in a common unit. And essentially, this common unit is gonna be gross domestic product. So, you know, you will have, for example, in the employment report, you have a news about unemployment, which is a rate of unemployment, and then the number of jobs created. So these are two different uh, unit of measure. So what I'm gonna show to you is, so we'll provide a way to translate them in a common measure. So how to do this? Very, uh, let's try to slightly formalize it. So here I denote by YQ a target variable. Here in this case, gross domestic product growth at time t. Omega V is a vintage of data, data that are available in a specific moment. V is uh, the moment in which you collect this data. And uh, this data contain quarterly, monthly, possibly weekly, daily data. And, uh, okay, so what is an outcast? It's, it's just uh, the projection of uh, our target variable onto this information set, 
Okay, so far is essentially the same as forecast. What makes the difference with respect to forecast is uh, are the characteristics of this uh, omega. And what are these characteristics? First of all, it has jagged edges. What does it mean, jagged edges? It means, uh, you know, today we have uh, employment data for the, in the United States up to April. Industrial production we still have up to March because it's going to be released April in a week. So in a sense, you have sort of missing data at the end of your data set, that's jagged edges. Moreover, it contains mixed frequency. You have GDP, which is quarterly, uh, industrial production that is monthly, weekly claim uh, that are weekly, and, uh, and so on. And third, it could be large. Why it's large? Because uh, you have a lot of data releases that the market look at that. And moreover, what you have to do, you can update this projection anytime new data are released. So when new data are released, you have this information, omega v, that becomes omega v plus one. It can be after five minutes, for example. And interestingly, this index here, that con uh, uh, the index for the vintages is different from the, the index of time. This is uh, what makes the difference with traditional forecast. And this, uh, intervals, so this, the interval between two consecutive data releases are short and uh, also irregularly spaced. Uh, okay, so when there is a new data release, as I say, the information set uh, expands. Why, for example, in a week we will have industrial production for April, we will have a new number into our data set. And interestingly, what you can do, you can decompose the uh, you can look at the difference between the new forecast and the old forecast. And actually, you can rewrite this revision, this forecast revision, as a weighted sum of all the news that are happening in the, uh, in the, between time v and time v plus 1. So what happens within v and v plus 1, a certain set of variables are released. The difference with respect to what you were predicting for that variable is the news. And then you, weigh, you have a weights attached to this. What are these weights? They are essentially, it's the Kalman gain. It's the same way it works, the Kalman gain. Here there is a complication due to the fact that uh, in these cases, the vintage and time is different. But it's just a technical. OK, so now. What we have to do is just to compute this projection, update them, and look at these weights. Uh, which kind of model you have to use? So first of all, in order to have this neat interpretation in terms of news and the weighted news for, uh, for uh, uh, your updates, you need the model that is able to make forecasts for your input variables and also for the target. Uh, second, it has to be estimated on many series while retaining parsimony. While many series, again, markets look at many, many variables. They are obsessed with the many re data releases. And third, you you, this uh, model needs to handle jagged edges, mixed frequency, uh, missed data, and so on. How to do this? Extremely simple. Just get the parsimonious model that can be cast in the state space. The Kalman filter techniques will do it for you. Uh, yeah, this, this is a, a set of, uh, just to convince you that the kind of variable people look at can be large. So this is uh, the important data releases in the United States for this week, next week, and so on. So there are many data. So what is a model that has this characteristic? One, an example is a dynamic factor model. We have heard a lot about this. So you have, uh, essentially here, you gain parsimony by exploiting the fact that the macro data can move a lot. If they can move a lot, you can think that uh, there is a common factors that is driving all of them. And then you model this common factor as VAR here of order P. So this model is parsimonious, robust for big data. There has been a lot of literature recently showing that this model works extremely well. It can handle a lot of series. Actually, this is a model that turns the curse of dimensionality into a blessing. So a lot of data can be helpful, make the model more robust. And however, there, is, there are also other alternatives. So for example, uh, a mixed frequency vector autoregression model could do the same job. You can cast it in a state space form, 
And then you can use shrinkage by Isham prior in order to make it work with big data. Uh, okay, so how we are gonna handle this? So missing data, you know, you can easily do the uh, missing data within uh, a state space model. Essentially what you can do is to say, you know, when you don't have a data, just attribute at an arbitrary uh, number and just say that the error in the observation equation is infinity. This will do the job. Uh, mixed frequency is very similar to missing data. Essentially, mi mi a lower frequency variable, you can think of it as uh, a temporally aggregated and periodically missing variable. So it's, uh, it's easy to do. Estimation, you can do it uh, with quasi-maximum likelihood. It's robust, feasible, and okay. So this is, uh, okay. The one thing, so we are gonna work out this model with the daily data. So it's, uh, this is tedious because, you know, daily, you know, every month has a different, day, a different number of days and so on, but uh, it's tedious, but uh, you can work it out. It's uh, just a matter of getting uh, nerdy enough. Okay, so let's go to some uh, empirical results. So this is the real-time data flow that we consider. So the target variable is a gross domestic product, which is quarterly. And, you know, the variable we, uh, we include in the system are variable that uh, markets monitor. So industrial production, purchasing manager index. This is an index, actually, uh, they ask purchasing managers every month, do you think the economy is doing this, uh, this period better than the period before? Then they take the difference between the people that say it's better and the people that say it's worse. This is a balance of opinion. Uh, this is, it's very timely. You get it typically at the end of the month, you already get the month. Then disposal income, employment, housing starts, a bunch of stuff, prices, import experts, other surveys that people look at. This is similar to this purchasing manager index, but just for the Philadelphia area. This is an interesting survey because even if it's local, it's very timely. So. I think next week we will get the survey for the month of May. So it's, uh, it's one of the most uh, timely variable. Then stock, we also include some uh, financial variables, stock price, oil price, the spreads, exchange rate, and so on. Okay, so here is, uh, we just put this data and ex extract the common factors out of this uh, data set. And, uh, and then we project the GDP on this common factor. And so this is gross domestic product, while this smoother line here is a daily common factor. Every day you have a sort of a measure of daily GDP. Uh, one thing that you can do, you can look over time throughout the quarter and check how your estimate of this common factor improve. Okay, so, you know, every time here, new data arrives, you can get better and better estimates for your, day, your daily GDP. And this can be measured by the filter uncertainty. And uh, you see here is an example throughout the quarter. So for example, here we start at the beginning of the quarter, this is April. And then you go throughout the quarter until the end of the quarter, and then one other month until the data release. And you see that this uncertainty declines so saying that, you know, there might be some value in uh, updating the forecast uh, often. And here, we divide the data in some categories. The blue, ca uh, blue line here are the drops associated with the monthly variables. Green is the weekly, and uh, this sort of red here is a daily. And you see that most of the drops here are associated with the releases of monthly variables. So weekly and daily variable don't provide interesting information here. Okay, the model at work, this is an art test for this model. So was the model able to forecast the, uh, the Great Recession? So this is a forecast for the fourth quarter of 2008. So the forecast, we start making the forecast in, uh, I think here is October. And then, you know, there are some, uh, and we update it every day, and you see that there is uh, continuously, up, 
continuous decline, okay, there are a set of uh, negative news that are picked up. So here, this is the first news about the month of October, when a first release that was incorporating the expectations after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. So this generated a big drop. Okay, so what you can do now is, okay, this is a specific quarter. So you can look at the different quarters, and then what you can do, actually GDP released is this ball here. It was released only at the beginning, uh, at the end of January 2009, okay? So four months after the Lehman Brothers collapse, we could see essentially what happened to the economy. And now what you can do, you can compute the mean square error, how to do this. So this is a special forecast. This is a fixed event forecast. So you are forecasting the same object, but from different horizons. So you can look at the accuracy when you forecast at the beginning of the quarter. So you can put, do the difference between this point here and this point here. Then you can do for different, then you square. You do it for different quarters, you average. This will tell you the average error in mean square sense for a forecast done at the beginning of the quarter. And then you can do it another time here and so on. And you will have an auto sample mean square error produced at different point in time. And if you evaluate it, this is the kind of graph you, you obtain. So this red line here is the accuracy of uh, my grandmother forecast. GDP growth is 2%. Obviously, there is no value of, of information. We, she will never change her mind. It's 2% and throughout the quarter will be 2%. So the accuracy doesn't improve. Um, this line here, it's a sort of mimicking what expert judgment was doing, a set of uh, equations, single equation, then averaged, and so on. You see that you know, there is some value. So this uh, mean square error declines, but it stays very close to my grandmother's forecast. If on the other end you use the machine I was illustrating to you, then what you obtain is that, uh, just look at this yellow line, is a benchmark model. And you see that there is a decline, and uh, there are significant gains with respect to this, uh, uh, to this benchmark. Actually, in the paper, we evaluated these gains. They are significant and so on. And, uh, yeah, and here, there are uh, some other comparisons in which uh, we compare, for example, with uh, a model with and without financial data. And this confirms that in real time, financial data don't help a lot. And essentially, the reason why they don't help is because they are very volatile. They can be related to the cycle, but they are volatile. So this is uh, uh, the stock price, the, growth, the daily return, monthly return, quarterly return, year-on-year -year returns. And compared with our global factor, with our common factor, and you see that there is some information, but it's a low frequency. At high frequency, there is much. Okay, so let me conclude uh, this uh, uh, by saying, so this, these were the, the questions I was trying to answer. So how important is, uh, uh, is now casting relative to longer horizon forecast? So now casting is key. I hope I convince you about that. So there is a little predictability beyond the current quarter. The second question was, can we predict the present? And how relevant is informal uh, judgment? We can predict the present, and there is no need for informal judgment. And uh, finally, how relevant is conjunctural information? How often should we update the forecast? So it's worth to obsessively monitor this conjunctural information, because through time, you, you improve your, uh, uh, the, uh, the accuracy of uh, your forecast. Something I forgot to comment here. This ball here is the forecast obtained by professional forecasters. So similar accuracy. But you know, these guys cannot exploit this additional information. Okay, how much time do we have? Uh, like 10 minutes. Okay, very good. Uh, the interesting thing is that this model is extremely simple. Okay, so it's a factor model with only one factor and you know, 
the number of lags in the VAR is just one. It's, uh, we put it at the simplest, the simplest specification in order to avoid the temptation of you know, data mining and stuff like this. Now, the question is, uh, you know, does this simple model work also for other economies? Actually, I've done a lot of uh, work on the euro area. It works well. UK, it works well. You know, in this uh, industrialized economy, advanced economy, it works pretty well. Now, the challenge, an important challenge for this uh, very simple model is to go and see how do they work with, uh, uh, with emerging economies. You know, economies like this is the case for China that are fast growing. Remember, the model I showed to you is pretty stupid. It's a linear model, almost cadastic. It's, not, it's only one factor. So we try to put this model for China, which is a fast growing economy. You might think that there have been a lot of structure. So this is a, a calendar of data releases that the markets watch in China. It's pretty similar to the kind of data that uh, you look at uh, uh, in the United States. Less numerous, but it's similar. So you have surveys, industrial production, GDP. Actually, GDP is very timely in China. It appears after 15 days. So, so we already, so we will have this quarter already at the middle of July. So one thing that you, you can do, you can extract these common factors up to the, uh, out of this data and compare it with GDP. And here is uh, this common factor extracted in real time. So these, uh, so these are different lines because you know, it's uh, re-estimated every time. And the stars are the real time estimates compared with GDP. So this is this uh, a lighter area is the first vintage of GDP and this is the revised one. And you see that you know, this factor extracted with the statistical method out of this heterogeneous variable tracks pretty well GDP growth in, uh, in China, which is also suggesting that probably data in China are not that bad, unless if they are cheating in the producing this data, they are extremely good in cheating. So they are reproducing historical regularities. So you can put this in forecast. Essentially, you do the, uh, a regression of uh, GDP onto your factors. And this is from 2008. And these are the forecasts produced by the model. This is year-on-year -year GDP. And uh, OK, the red line is a little bit more sophisticated than my grandmother. It's not a regressive model of order one. And, uh, these uh, uh, diamonds here are the only forecasts that are available, at least that I was able to find on public data, about year-on-year -year GDP growth in China. They are produced at the end of every year by the IMF. And, you know, they are very infrequent, but it's interesting that, you know, very similar to the kind of forecast produced by this judgment-free this judgment machine. Uh, yeah, here are some... Uh, real-time forecast here. So this is a forecast. Yeah, let me, let me move, let me skip all this. I move to Brazil. So you can put this also to, to you can for now cast, try to now cast Brazil. Actually, Brazil is very interesting because I just realized that here there is an obsession about now casting. Here it's a, uh, I don't know those of you who know the Sistema di Expectativa de Mercado. So actually, the, the, the uh, central bank, Banco Central do Brasil, every day goes to the market participants and asks them, what is your forecast for year-on-year -year growth of GDP? And they do it every day. So every day they collect it. So it's really they are obsessed with this and now casting. And uh, so what do we try to do here? I, try, I will try to, to run a machine on the data that the market participants look at. Actually, there is a, a Fondação Getulio Vargas is also involved in this business. They produce a confidence uh, indicator. Interestingly, there is also a monthly GDP produced uh, by the Banco Central do Brasil. I know that you also have one. I would be interested in putting the, in the machine. You know, and uh, yeah, these are the typical uh, suspects, the usual suspects. Okay, GDP, industrial production, PMIs, and so on. Okay, so 
This is year-on-year -year GDP. The red line is the outer. And uh, these blue dots are the real-time, the daily updates of Banco Central do Brasil. So you can think of this as a very sophisticated now caster. So I said before, this judgmental forecast are infrequent. Brazil is the exception. Okay, so let's run a machine in real time at the same moment these guys did. And this is the kind of results you obtain. So it's interesting. So the machine is pretty much replicating what these uh, judgmental forecasters are doing. So here, for example, there are differences. Here, the model is doing worse. Okay, it's uh, deeper, it's forecasting a deeper recession. Here, the model is doing better. So it's uh, getting better the decline. I think both of them provide interesting information, complementary information. Uh, an interesting aspect of the, due to the fact that you can forecast all the variables, then you can look at the news you know, the importance of this data. And then you can look at uh, these uh, weights, this Kalman gain, and then you can look at how big is uh, this weight associated to each uh, variable. And then you can see what are the important releases. Okay, you can, if you are a market participant, knowing which releases are important is, imp is important because when they are released, better you don't go for a coffee. You stay in front of your computer. <laughs> okay, so here is a graph. And it seems that the important one are important experts, PMI, industrial production, employment is important, and so. Uh, this is the index of Getulio Vargas. Doesn't seem to be as important here. But this is a typical situation that we found in many economies. Consumer confidence doesn't help getting the signal in the economy. While other indicator like survey of production are very interesting. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, comparing, uh, you know, there are uh, not so many forecasts on year on year. So we want also wanted to compare with year on year forecasts. These are produced by IMF and OECD. And uh, so the IMF is yellow, OECD is blue. And you see that the forecast, essentially what happens is that the forecast produced by the model continuously is joining these dots. Uh, this is, I updated uh, yesterday night, and this is the forecast the model is making for 2013. So it's about 3%. I think it's very close to the last numbers of the IMF because it was moved down from 3.5 to 3. Okay, so this concludes the presentation. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? Sure. Uh. Well, Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, let me ask you something about the um, the way that you treat uh, your data. Um, like, how how do you use like how do you input data that are uh, completely like in, in different scales, and um, are, are you using variations or um, especially because you you are composing like daily data with. Uh, monthly data, so we're using like year over year, but how do you do this? So, uh, something, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for uh, your question. Uh, something I forgot to, the, uh, to discuss is that this model work with uh, stationary data, so all data are transformed to stationarity. So, for example, industrial production, we put month-on-month uh, -month growth for industrial production. For daily data, so what the way we treat uh, uh, daily data, we put them in day over day. Mm -hmm. So, like for the stock price, we put the daily return. But then, what do we? The way we treat this data, we link them to monthly GDP by thinking of monthly GDP as, you know, an average over the month of an unobserved daily GDP. That's uh, that's the slide that went very fast about aggregation. You can think of uh, higher, fr lower frequency data as uh, temporally aggregation and periodically missing. You can think of uh, GDP industrial production as uh, an average 
of uh, a daily industrial production that you observe only at the end of the month. That's mm -hmm. the way we treat it. Okay. But do you, do, you. You, um, like, do you seasonally adjust the data? This, uh, all the data we are using here are uh, uh, the data that the market participants look at. So it means that in the United States, they were seasonally adjusted. For other economies, uh, for example, for China, this was very important. In that case, data are not seasonally adjusted, and what the people look at is year on year. So if you look at the screen of the, Bloom, uh, the Bloomberg screen in front of the traders, what they look at is the year on year uh, kind of data. Okay, thank you. So that's. Um, Hi. Uh, is there any room for imposing restrictions from theory, and do you think that would be could be useful? Actually, this is something uh, I've been working on, and uh, I'm uh, continuing working on it. Essentially, what uh, one way of doing this is uh, to include what I've been doing. Let me tell you, I have a DSG model, like uh, so, completely informed by theory, which is uh, typically is a quarterly frequency. So people make a decision at uh, quarterly frequency and so on. So what we do, we add uh, to this, uh, uh, we have uh, this system and then we add this conjunctural information. And essentially the way we add this conjunctural information is a sort of, uh, you know, people in this economy, agents in this economy can, uh, uh, can get some uh, new information about the current state of, uh, uh, of the economy by looking at conjunctural indicators. But uh, this is something I'm working on. And interestingly, since DSG models, you can uh, cast in a state space form, and this, uh, all this technology immediately applies. But I think it's extremely important. Any other questions? So you had a slide about uh, the consensus forecast in Brazil, is that right? And uh, the factor model results. Can, can you go back to that, please? So these are the average, the cross-section every, every day? Yeah. And how do you fare, how do you compare with them, uh, the factor model? set omega v. V in that case is going to be the 1st of April 2012. So we, um, we make sure that we have the same information of the, of the judgmental forecast and we make the, the prediction. So these two things are based on the same information set. Okay. So it's, uh, but so yours is based on the factor model. Yeah. Yeah, that was my question. So oh, how do you compare in root mean square error with them? So here I didn't compare mis root mean square okay. errors. But one way of doing, you can do the difference between every point. This is the outturn. You do the difference between the two, square and average. That's a possibility. That's yeah, I just wanted to know the result. <laughs> ah, I didn't compute it. It's OK. I didn't see all the data that you use, but I'm not sure if all of the data that you're using uh, were available in real time, uh, not for Brazil, for, for the US. Um, and my guess is that they are all, they're not all of them, I don't know. And if yeah. they are not, how can you really see what is the uh, performance of the mod in real time? So, yeah. actually, we, uh, when I first started working on this, this was one of the main criticisms. What I've been trying to do at the time was to do a pseudo real-time exercise. I didn't have all this uh, real-time data, so what I was trying to do is to mimic 
more or less the data available. And since there was not in real time, I didn't have data revisions. Now, in this exercise here, we are fully real time. And we downloaded this data by Alfred, is the Archival Federal Reserve of St. Louis database. So every day here, we have uh, exactly the data that were available at that time. It's uh, another tedious exercise that I had to do. So this, uh, these results are really, it's a truly real-time backtesting. Manufacturing new orders available now in real time? Sorry? The manufacturing new orders, durable yeah. goods, is now they are available? available? Yeah. Actually, they did a great job at the St. Louis Fed. They are creating this uh, real-time database for all the data in the United States. So it's uh, from, uh, I think, from 96, and they are increasing over time. So I'm very happy. Uh, I was very happy when I saw this uh, new data because one of the criticisms was, yeah, but you're not really real-time. You know, there are a lot of people that are obsessed with real-time. Uh, Athanasio Orphanidis was my, my discuss and then say, you know, but uh, you are cheating here. If you put real time, it doesn't work. Actually, the result I showed to you show that uh, actually real time here doesn't matter, the revisions. Oh, 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 I run the same mode. It does matter a lot. But anyway, um, you know, when you don't do real time, the, the fit is really, really good. In real time, it's a totally different story. But this is real time. This is real. Okay. Another question that I have is, uh, okay, you have a lot of variables. Uh, but what is the guarantee that you have that some of them are, are working against the model? I mean, if one is going to one place, another is going to the other place, putting a lot of stuff and then running every day might be counterproductive. How can you account for that and how are you measuring it? Actually, this graph tells that actually this is not the case because you see, every time new data arrive, this uh, forecast becomes more accurate. Yeah, but that's because it's becoming more, uh, the information is getting closer to the release of GDP, so you're getting more close information. Yeah, but when you get closer when to GDP, it's because there is a new data arriving. So here, every mo time you move from one point to another, it's really new data arriving. Mm -hmm. So for example, if uh, today, I, to, uh, I don't know, if I update the model, at the end of the day, and there is only uh, stock prices included there. So my new forecast will just reflect stock prices, and if it is uh, bad, I would observe uh, an increase here. Actually, it doesn't, it's not the case. There is another reason, actually, this, uh, this issue of selecting data in these factor models. You know, when you go big data, then you have the issue, yeah, but in the end, why don't you put everything, the result of the game yesterday? So here, actually, what we are doing, I didn't have time to discuss, it's in the paper. What we do here, we really mimic the markets. And the markets, you know, they, they have this screen and you can look at, you know, the data they look at. And uh, moreover, they also attribute, Bloomberg provides to you also the weight that the market participant put at the particular release. So here, essentially, we put all the variables that the market participants are interested in. Now, if there is a release that is not important, we still put in there because, you know, knowing that there is no information is informative, like the consumer confidence. That's... Um, okay. Uh, let's thank Domenico. So, thank you.